Hi, welcome to the University of Maine at Machias. I'm John Reisman, Chair of the Professional Studies Division. I'm very pleased to welcome Gene Conlog here tonight. Gene is a member of the Maine Woods Coalition, the town manager of Millinocket. Um, this is actually his second visit to Machias uh, in recent memory. Uh, he was here as one of our Libra speakers in Searching for Sustainability seven years ago. Uh, Gene is speaking tonight in opposition to the proposed national park. Uh, we had Senator Cynthia Dill here two weeks ago speaking in favor of it. Uh, these events are part of the university's efforts to uh, be an environmental liberal arts institution. Uh, and uh, that means uh, speaking to environmental issues from a, a variety of different perspectives. Um, and I'm very happy that Gene was willing to come here tonight. I'm also glad it didn't snow. We were a little worried about that. Um, Without further ado, uh, I'll just mention uh, one other thing. On the uh, uh, handout, you'll see a resolve that was passed by the Maine legislature uh, opposing this national park, um, and certainly is one of the things that, that has launched this into a statewide, uh, statewide issue. Uh, so without further ado, I, I, oh, I should mention after Gene speaks, we'll be having a moderated Q&A. Uh, if you uh, want to ask a question, just let me know. I'll be out there with a the mic. Please stand up, state your name and where you're from, and Gene will try to answer your question as best he can. So without further ado, Gene Conlock. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. Nice to be back. Uh, I think the last time I was here was like uh, Professor Reisman said back in 2004. Uh, I want to thank you all for attending. And uh, Professor Reisman, I want to thank you for inviting me uh, back again. And what I have tonight is uh, a presentation for you uh, talking about our position in opposition to the proposed national park up in the Katahdin region of the state. And I have provided packets up back, and I think it looks like all of you have gotten a copy of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit, and I want to start talking specifically to some of these uh, exhibits that are in your packet so that I can make a little sense of it for you. Uh, First of all, uh, I am the uh, vice chairman and vice president of the Maine Woods Coalition, um, and we were formed a number back in uh, January of 2001, and the purpose of the organization was twofold. First of all, to promote economic development in our service area, and secondly, to oppose the creation of the 3.2 million acre national park that was proposed by Restore the North Woods. Now, the membership of our organization uh, comes from the four counties that would be affected directly by that 3.2 million acre proposal. So those would be Aroostook County, Penobscot County, Piscataquis County, and Somerset County. And if you uh, took a copy of the membership blank, you'll see what the qualifications are to be a member. You either have to live there, uh, have property there, or have a business there. Uh, and those are three of the main qualifiers. And hopefully some of you do have some connection to the area that you could become a member if you would like. Uh, going. Uh, past that now uh, as to the organization I work with. I like to have a little interaction with the audience, so I'd like to poll you on a couple, three questions very quickly. Uh, how many of you like to hunt? Okay. And how many of you like to snowmobile? A few. And how about uh, anybody here uses ATVs? And even if you don't do those things, how many of you would view those activities as being important to Mainers and to our economy here in the state? Okay. And it's kind of a predictable result, as you might suspect. But as you may or may not know, national parks either greatly reduce or don't allow at all any of those activities. And in an area where I come from, up in the Katahdin region, every one of those activities are very important to us. ATVs are a coming thing now because we finally have a new trail opened up that connects down into the Brownville area. But hunting is very important. Uh, ATVs are going to become very important. Snowmobiling is our lifeblood in the wintertime. And not this winter, of course, because we haven't had much snow. But we are getting a little bit more, and it is coming back. And, and, and this is just the tip of the iceberg that we deal with when we start talking about the national park. Traditional uses, our cultural heritage, our traditions are all threatened by that park. And a person can say, well, it's only 70,000 acres, and it's only going to be in this little area, and it's going to be whatever. Do not be fooled by that. 
the goal of these people is not just to have a 70,000 acre national park to the east of Baxter. It is to make that the anchor parcel for the larger 3.2 million acre Maine Woods National Park that has been talked about by Restore for the last 15 or 16 years. And the problem with that 3.2 million acre parcel that they would like to have, which would be about the same size as the state of Connecticut, is that it is in the very heart of the wood basket of the state of Maine, not just our area, but of the state of Maine. So if they ever get that 3.2 million acre park, the forest products industry in this state is going to go down the drain very quickly. And that would, that would affect thousands, literally thousands of people and their livelihoods, their families, their traditions, their culture, and everything else that goes with it. So that is the very central focus of why we oppose a national park, whether it's 70,000 acres today or 3.2 million acres tomorrow. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm going to refer to the packet here in a few minutes, and we'll go through that item by item. But uh, Roxanne Quimby first purchased her initial 25,000 acres of land up our way back in 2004, excuse me, 2003. And she got that land uh, in a deal with Irving. Irving was selling off their land to the eastern, on the eastern boundary of Baxter State Park, and there were at least three major parcels of land that they were trying to sell. She bought the northernmost parcel up in the Matagamon Shin Pond area. Uh, the Gardner family bought a second parcel, and the Haynes family uh, bought the third parcel. And of course, the Gardners and the Haynes are well known uh, logging outfits in uh, northern Maine. Since 2003, she has purchased those other two parcels which gives her approximately another 34,000 acres for a total of 59,000 acres to the east of Baxter State Park. Now, one of the things that uh, propelled her purchase to begin with, uh, and it's the first item in your packet, and it is a letter from uh, former Governor John Baldacci to me back in January of 2004. The story was uh, when I was in Rotary, we had a guest speaker from Irving back in December of 2003, and he was uh, talking about the sale of some of this land and some other issues for Irving and whatever. And so I thought, you know, clearly, because uh, he made a comment that the state uh, wanted them to sell some land to people like Roxanne Quimby. And I thought naively that that wasn't going to be the case. So I decided to go back to my office and write a letter to the governor to ask him about that. And here was the letter that came back. And sure enough, uh, the state had uh, encouraged Irving to sell some of that land to what they term a conservation interest, who happened to be Roxanne Quimby. And that has opened the door for her to plan a national park on our doorstep. Now, part of this is um, that when you look at this uh, national park idea, sometimes what you do, if you're going to be successful, it has a lot to do with the approach that you take to bring something about. And Roxanne's approach was, as soon as she bought the land, was to announce her intentions to create or donate this land to the government for a national park at some point. And then she started evicting people who had leases on her land for small little camps or whatever. She uh, almost drove a sporting uh, camp business right on the edge of her land out of business. And she uh, gave us one year to continue to snowmobile there, hunt there, or do whatever. And then she was going to put up gates and whatever. Well, we were able to mitigate a little bit of that for a while. We still have a snowmobile trail that goes up through some of that area. Uh, actually, it's been moved across the east branch of the Penobscot. I stand corrected. But we got about an extra one year to do that. Um, I want to make sure I'm not double, uh, doubling myself back here. But anyway... Uh, like I said, she shut down sporting activities. Uh, she didn't want ATVs there. She hates motorized recreation, snowmobiles, ATVs, some, uh, dirt bikes or whatever. Uh, she is against hunting. She is against trapping. Uh, and she threatened other traditional access issues by the use of her gates and her signs. And to me, that is not a good way to approach an area that you want to create some project around. Uh, to tell us that we're going to have a national park whether we want it or not, uh, that's not a good way to talk to somebody from Maine, probably not from most states. We don't, uh, we don't care for that very well. And so we formed uh, 
some real activities against that park over time, and that's what we are doing today. And I'm here tonight to speak to some of those things that we're doing and some of the other things that uh, have happened. Now, as I said, her idea on this national park uh, would harm thousands of people in northern Maine, also in other parts of the state. But in that area in particular, obviously, because that's right at the impact area. That's the impact zone, okay? So when she is doing this, she's not just doing it to the Katahdin region. She's doing it to the whole state of Maine. And it would open us up under a National Park Service edict, okay? We would be subject to their regulations. They can go beyond their boundary and extend their influence over other people's land because of the classification of the area. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And they... Uh, part of this, excuse me, part of this is under the Clean Air Standards Act, okay? And we'll talk about that too. So as, as uh, we progress along, the new thing that they are trying to get, which is something that they must have in order for a national park to progress, is that the government must undertake a feasibility study. And a feasibility study must be authorized by an act of Congress. There is no other way for that to be done but through an act of Congress. And because we have the very strong support of Senator Olympia Snow, Senator Susan Collins, and Congressman Michael Michaud, along with the legislature and a number of others, we have been able so far to block her from ever getting anywhere into Congress with such a, with such a bill to be passed. Now, what they tell you is, and you probably heard that here two weeks ago, is that the feasibility study is just to see if it would work. You know, would it be a good idea or not? One of the things that you find with feasibility studies for national parks is they pay a little bit of lip service initially to your local economy, and they'll even come back and have a local meeting. But the feasibility study is not about is it good for the area, it's is it good for the National Park Service? Does it meet their criteria? Does it preserve something historic, something they want to preserve or whatever? It has very little do, to do with whether or not we're going to throw that logger and his uh, family, you know, onto welfare. It has to do with what's in it for the National Park Service. So as long as we can continue to block the feasibility study from ever taking off, we continue to have her in, at least if you're playing chess, we would have her mated, okay? We're not quite to a checkmate just yet, but we have her in mate. And every time she moves, we put her in mate again. And that's what we've been doing very hard since she came to uh, Milnaka for a forum, two forums actually last year, one in May and one in July. And I think that we have really uh, pushed back on her pretty well since that time. So with that being said, uh, I want to start working on the items that are in the packet. And the first uh, one that you see after the letter to, uh, or the letter from Baldacci is a memo to the town council that I wrote back on September 27th of 2011. And you can see by some of this what this is about. And I'll just very quickly summarize it for you. What this is, it goes back to the year 2000, when Great Northern Paper uh, had been purchased by a new owner. Uh, and he was putting in a huge investment of about $150 million, primarily into the big paper machine up there called Paper Machine 11. And as part of that process, DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection here in the state, had to amend Great Northern's license for the emissions that would result from this rebuild. Now, the irony is, despite what you read in here, you, you actually you won't probably see it in some of this because I don't have the whole packet here, uh, the Denver Office of the National Park Service and also the Denver Office of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sent a letter to the state protesting their approval of that air emissions amendment. And they demanded that that be delayed for more study and more input from the federal government and whatever. And what you uh, have here, you have a couple of things. The uh, second page, uh, this is a letter from these folks out in uh, Denver. And I'm just going to read it down here in the uh, bottom paragraph. It says, even though the Great Northern Paper Mill is more than 100 kilometers from all these PSD Class I areas, we believe that the magnitude of the emission increases proposed uh, easily qualifies this, type of, this proposal as the type of large project which, according to EPA guidance on PSD, is supposed to be brought to the attention of the appropriate federal land managers. Well, in English, what that means is, is that this is the Class I area 
uh, that we're talking about that I alluded to a few minutes ago. A class one area is what surrounds these national parks that were created on or before uh, 1977. So the uh, Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service were sending a letter to DEP to protest, and they themselves acknowledged that even though this was outside the, the uh, limit of 100 kilometers or 62 and a half miles, they were concerned about it, and they wanted to have input. They also mentioned the Moosehorn uh, Wildlife Reserve or Refuge, and I think they might have mentioned Campobello, I'm not sure. But we are outside of those uh, class one boundaries, okay? But here's the real kick. If you go to the uh, last page of this little handout down at the footnote, and again, I'm trying to show you how pernicious the National Park Service can be. The footnote says, an integral vista is a view from within a class one area of, the, of an essential feature outside the area. Now, in our case, what would that mean? If you were looking at Acadia National Park, and at Acadia, you know, we're outside, we're more than 62 and a half miles as the crow flies from Acadia. But what would be part of an integral vista in our area that people inside that 62 and a half mile uh, radius might like is a good view of Mount Katahdin. And as you know, uh, those of you who have been here for a long time or anybody over our area, you know that the views of Mount Katahdin, there's no such thing as a bad one, okay? So they claim that, you know, that, or they would, classify that as part of an integral vista, even though it's outside the class one area. Now, what you will hear from the uh, pro park people is that, well, new parks now all must be class two areas. That's true, okay? That will be the classification that they get. And if you go to the next handout, uh, this is from the National Park Service uh, Explore Nature series, and they talk about this class two area. But what it also says is that the federal land manager, this is the person who would be in charge of a park or a parcel of federal land, they can petition or start the uh, effort to reclassify a class two area into a class one area. Now the implications that has in the Katahdin region is very simple. We have two paper mills that are less than 20 miles from the southern boundary of her proposed park. Well within, obviously, the 62 and a half mile uh, class 1 boundary. And even with a class 2 boundary, that 62 and a half mile radius is still going to be there. And they can petition, the federal land managers could petition to reclassify that to a class 1. Now, again, if you go to the um, uh, second page here, it gives you a little bit of information about class 1 areas. And I won't get into a whole lot of detail, but, uh, but you see down at the very bottom of that page, I uh, blocked that off. And it talks about the National Park Service's current working definition of adverse impact under the Clean Air Act is any impact that diminishes the area's national significance, impairs the structure and functioning of ecosystems, and impairs the quality of the visitor experience. And the next paragraph down, or the next sentence, uh, it talks about this is meant to mean perceptible visibility changes that interfere with the management, protection, preservation, or, underlined, enjoyment of the visitor's visual experience. Now, if Roxanne Quimby was able to get her park in that area, and it's going to be, a, uh, at least as far as we know from what she said in the past, it's going to be a wilderness park, similar to what Baxter State Park is, okay? So it's not going to have all the amenities that you see at Acadia, you know, a nice sand beach to go to, ride, you know, drive up the top of the mountain and do all these things. This is a wilderness experience, primarily for people who want to tramp into the woods, pitch a tent, or occupy one of these mud huts, for a few days and commune with nature. Nothing wrong with any of that, except we don't really need it because you can do the same thing at Baxter State Park, and that's been there since uh, the 30s, okay? So we are very, very concerned about the impact that a park would have because if they ever tried to move it up into a Class 1, it would probably close the paper mills in Millinocket and East Millinocket. Now, fairly speaking, the mill in Millinocket is not yet running, uh, since the new owners took over, but it will probably come online the next year, year and a half. And that's going to be a function of several things like a natural gas line coming up through and some other things. But they can, uh, they, the National Park Service, would have great power and authority over Millinocket, East Millinocket, and other communities in that area because of these regulations. Now, that being said, changing gears a little bit, 
I want to go to the next exhibit, and this is just to give you an idea of uh, what we're dealing with here. You'll hear, uh, and I think uh, Senator Dill, when she was here, might have mentioned, you know, that tourism jobs are good jobs and all these other things or whatever. And, you know, there's a fact to this, that some jobs in the tourism industry, as I'm sure you all realize, are good jobs, and they pay well, they have benefits and whatever. But the vast majority of jobs in the overall uh, uh, leisure and hospitality services, as it's stated here, but that's tourism, many and most of those jobs are low wage, no benefits, seasonal or part-time work. They aren't going to provide a good living for a family. And if you go up to the top of that list, you see uh, number two in the list is manufacturing. Now, this was from 2007, this survey, but it, it's good to indicate something, okay, as far as a comparison. The manufacturing jobs, on average, paid $44,000 plus a year. The leisure and hospitality services, or the tourism jobs, around, this, these are statewide averages, was 15700 So about a third of what a manufacturing job would pay is what the average job in the tourism industry pays. Now, having said that, and, and sounding like uh, uh, somebody contradicting themselves, we, uh, we want tourism in our area to flourish as well, okay, because it's part of our economic base. And as you know, tourism is the single biggest industry in the state of Maine. So we don't say no to tourism jobs, but what we are saying is if we have a choice between a papermaking job and a job cleaning rooms in a motel, and no offense to anybody who makes a living that way, we are going to spend our time and opt for those jobs that pay good money, that have benefits, that help support the state through taxes and all other things, and give people purchasing power. As you move on to the next exhibit, you'll see that it's a folded over a double map. And we used this back in July at one of uh, Roxanne's forums up there in uh, Millinocket. And what this is, this is something that came, actually, uh, the maps came from the Restore the Northwoods website from several years ago. And what it shows you when you open this thing up is that you see the yellow area, which is the proposed 3.2 million acre park that Restore would like to do. And if you look at that, you see these few green places in there, including Baxter State Park and the other couple, three places that are state-owned areas, okay? And in the 12-year period between 1994 and 2006, look at all the other changes that happened in that area targeted by Restore through conservation easements, purchases by people who wanted to preserve the land, not use it for uh, forestry or logging. Look at all the different activity there. And if you go to the inside of this uh, flyer, what we did is that we put together the flyer to show the maps and also on the inside to have some questions uh, that we uh, provided answers to. You know, what area would be studied? Well, it would be Roxanne's 70,000 acres where she wants the park to be. Now, one thing that you also need to know, and I say quite often that she is a moving target. We, first of all, she doesn't own 70,000 acres to the east of Baxter State Park and to the west of the east branch of the Penobscot, which is where she's targeted her park. She owns currently only 59,000 acres, so she is still trying to find uh, or to buy those other acres in her target area. Uh, the question would be, would she limit the size of this park? Would she guarantee to the people of the Katahdin region in the state of Maine that the park would be limited to 70,000 acres, no more? She will not give that guarantee, and the National Park Service would not give that guarantee. And that's why we say that this is the anchor parcel for the 3.2 million acre park, because that's what the goal is of some of these groups, is to get the 3.2 million acre park. And that's what you see over here in this map. You can't see it from where you sit, uh, but this is just a larger version of our map from the Maine Woods Coalition that shows uh, land ownership changes, conservation easements, purchases for preservation, whatever. Uh, so we've covered that pretty well. I won't get into the rest of that, but basically... These are the types of issues that you get into when you start talking about uh, Roxanne Quimby and her park. It isn't just simply a 70,000 acre proposal. It is much more than that. Now, back in November, uh, at, during the uh, general election, 
uh, our neighboring town in East Millnocket held a referendum on whether or not they supported Roxanne Quimby's quest to have a feasibility study done uh, on the park idea. And the Maine Woods Coalition uh, put together a flyer, and that is this white sheet of paper here. And we uh, were urging people, of course, to vote no on the feasibility study. When the results came in on election night, 80% of the people who voted, voted no. Only 20% voted to support the idea of a feasibility study. Now, since that time, uh, there has been another poll done uh, by a local group, and we think it had some validity. You know, we're not going to say it's totally valid. But this poll is a telephone poll. was done in the Patton Mount Chase area, up at the northern edge of uh, Baxter State Park, where presumably the entrance into this new national park would probably be. And that survey returned the results of approximately 89% saying no interest in the park, no interest in the feasibility study. Uh, they want nothing to do with this. Um, when you look inside this uh, flyer, we uh, got some quotes from people who are opposed to the park. We picked up some things in newspaper articles of people who were opposed to the park. And you can see some of these. Uh, who, oppo who opposes this park? Olympia Snow. Susan Collins, Michael Michaud, Governor LePage, uh, the Maine State Legislature, and that's the, that's the uh, resolution you see on the back of your uh, uh, green sheet, I think it was. Uh, other organizations that have come to the forefront on this to oppose it, the Maine Snowmobile Association, Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, uh, the New Owners of Great Northern Paper, the Union of Great Northern Paper, among others. So you can see that there is a widespread uh, interest here in opposing that park. And if you go to the next page, it talks about what others say, and I won't read all these, but we have some pretty prominent people within the forest products industry being quoted in articles in the Bangor Daily News primarily uh, as to their opposition and why they oppose a national park. And you get into the last page, which is talking about some common questions that we have been asked over time. And again, I won't get into all of those, but you get the picture that this is a real subject of interest to our area and that there is very strong opposition to this proposal. Now you also have in the packet uh, copies of some of these resolu resolutions that were passed by various groups including the state, the town of Millinocket, the Maine Woods Coalition, uh, you have the uh, Snowmobile Association and SAM. Uh, again there are more of these but I just wanted to bring a sample of what we already have collected and again it shows the depth of the opposition to the park. And the fear is, is that it will in fact have a very major effect going forward on the forest products industry. And people say, well, again, you know, if it was only the 70,000 acres, uh, it already is owned by Roxanne, you're not going to cut any more wood there anyway because she's going to lock it up. That's true. And the 70,000 acres in that respect does not affect any more our forestry in the area because it's already lost to us. But it isn't lost if it becomes a national park. Now it becomes a very troublesome entity. The uh, last couple of items I have here uh, are a couple of excerpts. Uh, one's a short uh, description. The other one's an excerpt from a book. Uh, it has to do with two national parks that were created years ago. Uh, one down in Virginia called Shenandoah National Park. And the other one was the Great Smokies National Park down in Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina area. And what these two articles talk about is how people were forced through eminent domain by either the state or the feds to vacate their land in favor of a national park. Uh, now, people will say today who weren't alive back then, including myself, believe it or not, uh, well, you know, it's a, those are great parks today and the people benefit from it. At what price do people benefit when you take people off their land and away from their families and away from their traditions and their culture? Tell me how that's a good thing. Well, some people say because succeeding generations will appreciate it. Good for them. But people suffered real pain and real loss when they were forced off their land. And I believe, uh, and I don't have this documented yet, but I do believe that as uh, some of you may know the history of Baxter State Park, Percival Baxter was a former governor of the state of Maine, and he had a vision for the state to create a major park for the people of Maine. 
And he started that quest in the 20s going into the 30s. And that time frame coincides very nicely with the Shenandoah National Park and the Great Smokies National Park. And, when, and I believe what happened is because we had a senator from the state of Maine who was actually sponsoring a feasibility study and arguing for a national park in Maine that would include Mount Katahdin. And, and in a time capsule we opened up on our 100th uh, anniversary uh, back in 2001, there was actually an article uh, in that uh, capsule from the Chamber of Commerce listing their goals for uh, the upcoming uh, few years, one of which was creation of a national park in the Millinocket area. So you can see that this is not a new issue to us. History does seem to repeat itself. Have you ever heard that expression before? So here we go. I believe that when Percival Baxter saw what was happening in some of these other areas to create national parks by forcing people off their land, he said there will never be a national park in Maine. And he did oppose actively the national park that was proposed. And he started buying land privately and ultimately created enough parcels to put them together where he was able to create Baxter State Park. And that stopped the movement at that time for any further action by the feds and for a national park. So that's a very important piece. And uh, like I said, I'd like to sometime be able to uh, confirm that. But I think the time frames are so close that it makes sense to me that uh, that, that was part of what was in his thinking. And if that is what was in his thinking. I, I uh, certainly deeply appreciate his forward thinking back then. Now. There is another piece here, too, and I'm going to leave this with uh, Professor Reisman. It's called For the Good of All. This was a program on PBS hosted by Jessica Savage. Some of you will, will remember her. Uh, it was about, I think they call it Cuyahoga County, which I think is in the Cleveland area of Ohio. And they wanted to create a national recreation area. And they were told, and it's all right here, and so I hope some of you will have a chance to borrow it and look at it. They were told that the federal government would only take land from people who wanted to sell it. They would work with people who wanted to stay in the area. And as you might know, to a certain level, uh, which was really the subject of the uh, program, they lied. They took over some people's lands. They burned down some of those houses and other facilities. They, they, they made a complete mess of it. So I strongly recommend for anybody interested further in this uh, subject, borrow this DVD. See for yourself what these people are capable of doing and what they did do. Okay? Now, I, I'm going on here. Let me go on for a few more minutes if I can indulge your attention. Um, there are myths that have come up around this national park. You know, we, we always like to talk about myths and what the truth is and whatever. And, uh, of course, uh, some people think that my myth is their fact. I'm not sure. But, but I see these as myths. And I think some of these were talked about here two weeks ago. Uh, and I might paraphrase it a little bit, but you, some of you heard this before. Did anybody come to that session two weeks ago? Some of you, good. Uh, so the first myth is to be anti-national park is to be anti-tourism. And if you, I'm sorry, to be anti-national park is to be anti-tourism. The Katahdin area caters very nicely to tourism, to people who like the outdoors, who like four season uh, enjoyment in nature. Uh, our snowmobile industry, when we have a good year, is one that creates millions of dollars of revenue to our area. Now we have a new ATV trail or multi-use trail that will allow ATVs into our area. We are going to start doing very well with that going forward. We have Baxter State Park, the crown jewel of parks in the state of Maine, if not New England, that brings people to our area. We have people who come there to fish, people who come there to hunt, come there to trap, come here to camp, to hike, to whitewater raft. And you're going to tell me that the Millinocket and the Katahdin region is anti-tourism? Absolutely not. But we are against a national park because of what it could have for impacts on some of those and other things in our area. And again, the one you keep hearing the broken record on, the forest products industry. Another myth. National parks create jobs. And you heard a couple weeks ago that this is going to create maybe 30 or 35 jobs 
Well, that's nice. We want 30 or 35 jobs. But not if it puts two or three or 400 other people out of work. That's not much of a trade. And, and, you know, if you think about that, go back to what we were talking about earlier with the class one and the class two areas, okay? That is the hook, one of the hooks that the National Park Service has as a tool to dominate an area, even outside their boundary. Uh, a third myth, the proposed park area is a pristine area that needs to be protected. Really? Most of the 59,000 acres that Roxanne currently owns where she wants to create her park, have been heavily cut by the previous owners, the Gardner family and the Haynes family. In fact, uh, people in our area have already dubbed it a stump park, not a national park. It's a stump park. So if you want to go out into the stump park and sit on a stump and feed the squirrels or look at, you know, scrub brush out there, there it is. Great opportunity. But I don't think that meets the criteria of a national park. I don't think most people think it does either. The other part of that is this term pristine that is so ill used by so many people. Pristine means people have never been there before. Only the animals. Well, I can tell you that Maine is famous for its working forest that is owned by private landowners and has been that way since the state was created hundreds of years ago and before the state was created, but back in the Massachusetts days when we were part of Massachusetts. It is no more of a pristine forest than anything, okay? So when they say it's a pristine area, it is not a pristine area. Men have been, or mankind's been all over it for hundreds of years. Even Thoreau, uh, Thoreau uh, walked over it a couple, three times in one of his, I suspect, drug-induced comas, you know. Uh, I think he got lost somewhere up there. But, but seriously, uh, David, Henry David Thoreau visited the area two or three times. So he trammeled on the very land that they call pristine. It isn't. The uh, other myth, uh, we need to protect Maine's forest from development. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, the forests in the state of Maine are primarily owned by private landowners, major landowners. And... Again, it's been that way for several hundred years. And there is absolutely no compelling reason for these lands to be owned by the public as they are already being well managed. And this is also, remember, where thousands of people make their living. Okay? I keep putting that little fact in that seems to bother some people. No, nobody here, but, but uh, when I say that to some of these other folks, they get very uptight with that. Well, I'm not here to make them happy. I'm here to keep people who are working for a living happy and keeping them employed. That is my number one goal as a town manager and is a goal I have as well as a member of this coalition. Next myth, I'm almost through, believe it or not. The park will draw 275,000 visitors per year. Really? There is not one statistic anywhere that indicates that that is true. Do you know where that figure came from? You don't because you weren't there. But back in July when Roxanne Quimby had her public forum in Millinocket, she said, well, you know, uh, Acadia National Park gets between 2.5 and 3 million visitors a year. So if we only got 10% of that number to come to my park, she says, that'd be 300,000 people. Does that sound like a scientific fact to you? This type of park, wilderness experiences, according to national surveys, are actually in decline as far as people who come there. And you may have seen some articles. I mean, there was one article, I think, in the Bangor paper in the last maybe six, seven months. I'm not sure how long ago it was. But it talked about uh, families now are moving away from these types of places to go because the kids can't get their iTunes, or I don't know what it is. Their cell phones don't work, and, you know, they want to play video games and whatever. They don't have any interest in trudging through the woods and tripping into uh, uh, holes and walking down the streams and getting their feet wet. They want to be in a nice hotel room somewhere or on a beach. Dip, 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 okay? It's a declining part of the national park system, wilderness areas. I'm not saying we shouldn't have any wilderness areas, but right on the very boundary of this park that's proposed is the biggest wilderness area in New England, one of the biggest in the uh, east of the Mississippi, called Baxter State Park. But they don't like Baxter State Park. Why? 
because it doesn't have the same brand as a national park, and that's true, okay? There are a lot more people who've heard about uh, a national park, Acadia, let's say, than have heard of Baxter State Park outside the state of Maine. That's not all bad. So anyway, uh, enough of that soapbox. But keep in mind, no scientific data exists to support 250, 275, or 300,000 visitors a year. And I have great doubts that you would ever see anywhere near that number when the number coming into Baxter each year right now is only in the 70 to 80,000 range. Okay? Next myth, a park can coexist with a forest products industry. Well, you can see this one coming because I've been talking about it all night. Uh, just is not the case. They will interfere with the forest products industry. They will interfere with those mills, Millinocket and East Millinocket, and they could stretch down as far as Lincoln with their mill. Uh, they, they talk about only 1% of the unorganized territory, actually less than that, would be tied up in this national park. If it was limited to 70,000 acres or so, that would be probably true. But that's not really the issue. The issue is its incompatibility with the forest products industry as well as it's becoming the anchor parcel of restores 3.2 million acre park. Okay. And Roxanne Quimby has endorsed that 3.2 million acre park. She did it at the meeting uh, in July, and she did it at the meeting in Millinocket in May. And in fact, she actually added to it after she talked about the 3.2 million acre park, she says she'd be even happier if it could be a 10 million acre park, which would be almost the entire unorganized territory of the state of Maine. Now, there's a lot of other things we could talk about here. I could go on forever, uh, but I'm not going to. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can hear it. Uh, but seriously, there is a lot more to this story. I touch only the surface of it here tonight. I want to thank you for your uh, being so attentive and kind, and I would be more than happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Be shy. If not, uh, sir. sir. Uh, Andy Huffman, Joe's board. I got a question I don't feel to answer. Can you kind of get into the head of this Roxanne Quimby? Is she adamant in making this a federal park? To me, I'm looking at it. Why doesn't she just add it to Baxter State Park? But is, is, is the politics involved here? What's the deal? Because if you're a uh, me, if you're a conservationist, you've got a beautiful park right there, why not add it to Baxter State Park? I personally would like to keep the federal government out of it. So is she out of it about making it a federal park? Uh, yeah, she's been very uh, clear on her vision to have a national park. She has been willing to talk from time to time about other national alternatives like a national heritage area or a national recreation area, and I should talk about that for a minute. Uh, but she is pretty adamant, and part of it goes back to what I was just saying a couple minutes ago, uh, this branding idea. Uh, national parks have a brand that are known worldwide, according to her, and I think that's true. Uh, and so the draw of a national park designation, she thinks, makes it more successful than, say, Baxter. Now, there's another consideration here as well, uh, and she still do this even if she deeded it over to Baxter State Park for an expansion, and assuming that Baxter State Park would want to accept it, which would be another issue. Uh, she has probably between 20 and $30 million tied up in the land that she has purchased up there to this point. And unless she, uh, well, of course, she wants to give it to the federal government. But when we say she wants to give it to somebody, whether it's federal or state, that's true. But the other piece of that is, and this sounds like economic warfare, but, but don't think for a minute that every dollar of value in that land isn't going to be written off her taxes down the road as a gift. Oh, she gives it. That's right. She gets a tax deduction for that. So it's not, I've invested 20 or $30 million, and here you go, federal government, make the park. No. Here is 70,000 acres, make the park, and give me my tax deduction. And she has talked about creating a uh, trust fund uh, to endow the park so it wouldn't take taxpayer dollars. And she says she'll contribute $20 million to that, and she'll raise another $20 million to give them a $40 million endowment for this national park. 
with the idea being that if you could get a 5% interest rate uh, and the park, say, was two, two and a half million dollars a year to operate, that's where the money would come from. Similar to what Baxter did with uh, Baxter State Park. Um, and again, that's all tax deductible. It's not like she's just giving that money away and walking away from it. She's giving, she wants to give the money away, but walk away with the tax deduction. Now, that's the way the tax code is. So that's not, uh, a, you know, that's not anything unethical that she would do or anything like that. It just simply is a fact. And when somebody gets a tax deduction in this country, what happens with other people's taxes? They go up to cover the loss. Okay? But she's not real enthralled with Baxter State Park because it has the state affiliated with it, even though it's run by an independent, well, a three-member advisory board, or a three-member board of trustees. Uh, she's just leery of the state. But she likes the federal government. She loves the federal government because in her mind, and she says this, um, national parks are democratic because anybody can afford to go there. Uh, okay. Uh, am I democratic because I go buy a loaf of bread too? I've camped most of my life, and I'd rather go to a state park any day than any federal park. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just a bad idea. Anyway, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Hey, anybody else? Uh, yeah, uh, let me just uh, pull Would the map out so I can. Uh, that property out of public use, correct? Uh, not necessarily, but it certainly re it restricts the use. Uh, one of the things that the uh, Maine Woods Coalition said years ago, and it's in the brochure even, um, on the bottom of this fold out page right here, it talks about our position on conservation easements. What a conservation easement is, it's, it's another name for anti-development easement. What it means is, in most cases on these easements that you see out here in the forest today, is that you can still do your traditional, quote, traditional things there, like logging, you know, forestry, uh, generally hunting and fishing, camping, whatever. But you're restricted from developing it any further than what it is when the easement goes on. Now, a lot of people believe that that's a great thing because we're protecting the resource. For hundreds of years, the private landowners have already protected the resource. It's how they make a living, see? This is a scam by the government to spend money that it doesn't have. Now, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to disagree with that, okay? But, so I'm going to take it one step further. The state of Maine has squandered millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to help subsidize or pay for conservation easements for these groups like the Appalachian Mountain Club, the Nature Conservancy, the, you know, and whoever else is out there. And all it amounts to is you have lined the pocket of the current owner who had no intention to do any development there to begin with. You have then put a restriction on the deed for the next owner who might have different ideas what he might want to do with his land that he will no longer be able to do because of this pre-existing conservation easement. And it does restrict the use of that land in different ways. So these are, my opinion, these are bad, bad ideas. You know, the Land for Maine's Futures uh, money is what's used primarily to do this stuff at the state level. And if they would rework or revamp their target to helping to make recreational corridors, as an example, for trail development, whatever, that would actually help the economic growth of this state. When you put this massive, what's called landscape easement over a 100,000 acre parcel, you haven't done a thing to help the economy of the state of Maine. In fact, you have probably taken away from the future potential of that land on behalf of the people in the state of Maine. 
So when you see these uh, areas that you mentioned here, uh, to me, it, it, it's, it, it's disgraceful. But that's what we had in office uh, down there over the last eight or ten years, and, and this is what they did with the money. That probably wouldn't qualify because this is money comes from a bond issue. But they could have spent that money much more wisely and strategically than what they did. All that work is on the easements. Historically, time that they went over the last time they came. The easements restrict developments on large parts of the land. And one of the things that's not allowed is construction of buildings or that includes windmills. So all these areas. Uh, you're talking about the uh, easements? Yes. Uh, w w when you look at uh, this map over here, can you pick this up if I move? Well, I guess maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to be successful with that. Uh, if, if you look at this map, you, again, I know you can't see this well from where you're sitting, but this shows the outline of the restore proposal, way up and through here, all the way up to the Quebec border. But you see, if you start at the Quebec border, you see all these different shades of color in here. And you see how it's almost a solid chain down here from uh, Jack over to Greenville, over to the Katahdin region, National State Park being here, obviously. And then it spreads up like a cancer to the north. And some of these other easements up here have been there for a long time. Uh, there was something called the Northern Forest Compact back about uh, 20 or so years ago. And that was a scheme by the federal government uh, may as well get into this for a second. It was a scheme by the federal government to have a connected forest all the way from the Adirondacks in New York, across northern Vermont, northern New Hampshire, into Maine, all the way down to the coast right here down East Maine. And that effort pretty well stalled out and failed. However, the federal government, here's our friends again, they did a number on the Adirondacks, but making it almost a national park with a lot of inn holders and some towns stayed in there and whatever. And everything they do today, they have to get special permission to do. And so if they would have succeeded in that diabolical scheme, who knows where we would be as a state. But we're getting very close to it because these environmental groups, many of them, uh, you know, whether uh, they actually bought land or not, the clubs like the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, Restore, uh, all these groups have done nothing but harm this state. And... This is their result so far, to continue to buy land and whatever, put it into conservation easements, at least that. And the ultimate goal of most of them is if they ever caught fire on the 3.2 million acre park, they will flip those lands into the national park. So the Appalachian Mountain Club would love to flip that land to a national park, okay, among others. So this is what you have. Millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. Federal money, a lot of the federal, uh, what they call forest legacy money and others. Our land for Maine's futures money is in there. There's even a, some uh, private money from the, uh, uh, these non-profit environmental groups. But their goal is generally they buy it and they look to the government to reimburse them. So they go up and buy some more. The Nature Conservancy does that quite often. So anyway, uh, that's the uh, North Compact lecture of the night. But you can see that there are some very real issues here. And once they start getting those types of holes on the land in the state of Maine, which again, are in most of it is in the heart of the wood basket of the state, the prime wood basket, they can shut this state down economically, at least in the northern half of the state. And that's the importance of the forest products industry. And you see it here in Washington County, uh, where you have some big easements that have come outside of your land here in the last few years. And people say, well, this is a good thing. And I'm... I don't want to object to people making a living, but they think that the best way to protect themselves was to have these easements. Well, it may work for some of them, but it doesn't work for the overall population going forward.
prior you know, to going to Millinocket, and I've been in Millinocket now for 13 years, but uh, just prior to that, I was the town manager down in Goolsboro. And that's one of these areas where these organizations were in there, Conservation Land Trust and a few others, buying up chunks of the coast. And, of course, by buying it up, they took it off the uh, tax rolls. And I questioned that when I was there. I was only there for about six months because the Millinocket job came open. I really kind of wanted the bigger challenge. Smart. And I got it. Uh, but seriously, I saw, even in that short period I was in Goolsboro, how pernicious these groups can be. And they'll grab up anything that they can. And I think that that is grossly unfair to the people of the state of Maine, to the people in these coastal communities, to these people who make their living on the water. Uh, I mean, there was a, there was a uh, constitutional amendment passed a few years ago, as I recall, that uh, basically gave the equivalent of tree growth status to coastal property that was used at you know, current use value for fishermen or whatever. Isn't it disgraceful that we have to pass a constitutional amendment to make it possible for a person to make a living because he wants to go out after a fish or a lobster? It's disgraceful. It's, disgraceful. it's absolutely disgraceful. And, and this is what we're dealing with. And whether you're inland in the Katahdin region or you're here in Machias or Jonesport or Goldsboro, we are all feeling the impact of these groups. And, and they're like uh, a little over the top, so I'll maybe not say that. Uh, for once, I'll refrain. They are dangerous groups, okay? They are dangerous groups. They mean you no good. Now, up our way, we have a term for this. We call it rural cleansing. And I think I coined that name a number of years ago, or one of my friends did, I can't remember, but it doesn't make any difference who coined it. Rural cleansing. And what does that mean? Well, uh, what it means is that we have people who are trying to drive other people out of their homes and out of their uh, places where they live, uh, where they work, whatever, where they've raised their family. And that is exactly the type of thing that the people who support these national park ideas, whether it's Roxanne's or Restore's, are trying to do. And when you look at the map and the outline and see some of the towns that are going to be directly affected if that 3.2 million acre proposal ever happened, uh, there is great reason to be very fearful of that concept. What they want, and, and there's something called uh, the Wilding Project, the Wilding Project by the Wilderness Society, and I think the Sierra Club perhaps, but certainly the Wilderness Society, and what their goal is, and it's in writing, okay, their goal is to depopulate essentially most of the whole of the United States of America. Depopulate it. Let it go back to nature. Now, can you imagine anything that crazy being out there as an idea and actually have people who believe it? It's not crazy. Not to them. No, but it's not crazy. It's also part of Agenda 21 to repopulate the cities and the urban areas and depopulate any of the forested or country or rural areas, which Maine has a tremendous divide. Let's move all the rural people down to the cities where they can be easily managed and controlled. Yeah, uh, just briefly, uh, in case the camera didn't pick that up, uh, she was asking or talking about something called Agenda 21. And what Agenda 21 was, uh, and when people talk about today, you know, they look at you funny. Agenda 21 was nothing more, it was than the Rio de Janeiro conference of uh, the different countries in the world. It was a UN-sponsored event. Uh, I think George Bush, uh, Herbert Walker Bush was there for some of it, if I recall. And what they met on was how to uh, fix or control uh, the climate change, the greenhouse effect, uh, all these other things. And they put together an agenda for the 21st century of their goals of what they wanted to do. And it became known by them, not by people out here like us, okay? That's what they called it. They called it Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century. And it has all kinds of different elements to it. But most of it was around uh, climate change and things like that. And then they had another conference, a follow the follow-up, five years later, 1997, in Kyoto, Japan. So there you had the Kyoto Conference. But that one didn't make much headway on saying the limitations that they were looking for from Rio in, 2000, in, in uh, 1992. Uh, so they are still trying to work through these issues. And as you know, there was another conference, was it in Copenhagen? 
uh, this past year, late last year, last fall, uh, and that made no progress on these issues. But basically, what some of the uh, elements of that are, and I'm going a little off the mark here on a national park, but yet there is a relationship because of saving the biosphere of Maine from people. Save it from us. Exactly. You know, uh, this is to me just off the wall. But anyway, this is what they seek to do. And they want to preserve areas like this. And, and, and there's one thing that comes to mind too, and I should have mentioned it before, but uh, have, maybe some of you have seen this, maybe not. But they, some of these environmental groups like to show you, show you a view from space. And it's from pretty high up, so it covers most of the eastern part of the United States and Canada. And right in the area of the state of Maine, primarily, right, right through here, through that area that is owned by private landowners, primarily, they see this big black spot with no lights reflecting from the cities or towns or whatever. And at all costs, they say, we must preserve that because if, if we don't, we're going to lose it. You haven't lost it since 1620. Do you think you're going to lose it next, uh, in the next couple hundred years? Well, it may, might be a little bit too far out, but we're in no peril of losing this. What we're in peril of losing it to are the environmentalists, not to the working people in the forest. The reason it's dark is because it's a working forest. We don't cut trees at night. Okay? They, they think this is a great thing, and you see it here. I think uh, there's, there was an article in the paper just a week or so ago talking about uh, the Dark Skies Initiative. And uh, I know there was a bill in not this uh, legislature, but the one before uh, down uh, in the Hancock County area, the representative that was there, or Senator, whatever he was, and he introduced uh, a bill to protect the dark skies over the state of Maine. And what that means is, you know, turn off your street light so you get a better view of the moon, you know. Well, hey. Beauty, the beauty about Maine, except if you're in southern Maine, in some of the cities, you can go out on your front yard in almost any place you live and look up and see the stars and the moon and all those things we think are so beautiful, and they are. We don't need the government to tell us we're going to protect dark skies. And we don't need the government to tell us we're going to shut down a paper mill in East Millinocket or Millinocket. I just had to tie that back in. <laughs> This is going to be a little bit of a flip answer, okay? So I apologize, but just trying to make a point. Convenience stores that sell gas and beer would do quite well. Uh, stores that might sell souvenirs of the area that were made in China would probably do pretty well. Uh, your your hotels and restaurants obviously would do well if if a national park came in and it actually produced a significant number of visitors. Uh, but it would always be a threat to some of your natural resource-based industries that were in the area, which we've talked about ad nauseum here tonight, I know. So I won't say that term again. But, but suffice it to say that we would have a real uh, drop, I think, in our overall economic base that we have currently. There's always going to be somebody who profits from anything that you do. But there are also going to be sometimes losers. And we think that there are many more losers with a national park than winners. And when you look at the employment that they create, like I said, I think Senator Dill talked about 30 to 35 full-time people in a park. That doesn't begin to offset the potential loss of hundreds of other jobs in the area that would pay much more money. Does that answer your question? Well, partially, but the other thing, what other types of industry might be able to develop in that area or in this area uh, with, with uh, I can't think of the word I want to say. Right. Yeah. Well, but, but What, what type of businesses could be compatible with a national park? Well, if you look at uh, Bar Harbor, you could say, well, Jackson Lab. But, you know, they don't really want to do something in the state of Maine. They want to go where they can get big uh, uh, tax credits and whatever. So they're now looking at Connecticut for an expansion. 
Uh, any, any type of a hotel type of complex, uh, probably not a Las Vegas style casino, even though most people would probably rather have the casino. Uh, you, you might have other industries that, uh, if we could attract people into northern Maine, in north central Maine where the Katahdin region is, uh, any kind of an office operation. But you see, we're not on the map for these people who do those types of businesses very well. E even the state of Maine doesn't do well with that anymore. Uh, you know, there's a big boom down there in the Portland area for 20 years or so, uh, but they've had a lot of layoffs in some of those industries, like the people who make chips for computers, uh, financial institutions, or whatever. Uh, but we're probably not going to get those into smaller towns like Millinocket, East Millinocket, Patton, uh, Machias, uh, a little bit outside the area. But it's very hard for uh, them to make a decision to go to these communities because either we don't have the infrastructure, although Millinocket would, but then we might not have enough people to give them for employees of what they would need. And unless you could attract people from outside to come into the area and relocate, uh, it becomes a very hard sell. And I don't want to be real negative with this because, you know, uh, we are trying all the time to bring a diversity into our economy up there. But we do have certain challenges to make that happen. Well, uh, th there, is going, there is a demand, not just going to be, but there's a demand for people who can work in uh, paper mills, okay, that pay very well. Uh, but there are a lot of people today who just kind of shun the idea of paper mills because, well, it's manufacturing and we don't know how stable it is or whatever. Uh, the truth is uh, it's a more stable industry than people think. Uh, we've had trouble in our area, but it has been to, uh, due to a lot of different reasons. Uh, Clearly, if, if uh, our community colleges and our universities can be continue to train people in recreational type industries, uh, hospitality industry, uh, financial services, you know, we might not get, like I said, we might not get a financial firm in Millinocket, but you might get one in Bangor that will employ people from Millinocket. So these are the types of things that you can do. They would be compatible with the national park if they were close to them close enough to have an impact. Uh, but I think it's more a matter of the logistics of that as opposed to whether or not there's a national park there. Are there other industries that could work compatibly with the park? Are you talking about like hydroelectric? Or what, what are, you, are you talking about what, if to use, to you, he just said that the park, the park is supposed to be pristine. But are you talking about um, damming rivers, producing electricity? Uh, another couple of possibilities on that, and I don't really have too many more that come to mind right now, uh, and some of those are kind of passe now, but call centers would be one, and anything to do with information technology would probably be another one, uh, because they, they have no real environmental impact no matter where they're located. They're, they're, they're done in an office setting, so those types of things might be compatible. And, and you, I mean, they're compatible just simply because they have no reason to have a conflict. Any other? Uh, yeah. oh, yes, one more here. I have another question. Yes.
Any other uh, questions or comments or? My personal opinion would, uh, the question is, uh, do I think that they would find the proposed park to be feasible? And it's really an unknown. My, my, my best bet would be is that they would not. But because they don't look at it through the same eyes that I have, my concern is, is that they might force it, if you will, a bit, to come up to their criteria. Now, when we talk about that area that's under consideration, you know, I was joking a little bit about, not really joking, I mean, it's true, about the stump park atmosphere of two-thirds of the land that she's purchased. But there are some other nice natural features in that general geographic area. But almost all of them revolve in some way around views of Mount Katahdin. And like I said earlier, and, and I mean this very sincerely, in my mind, there is no bad view of that mountain. So are we going to cover the whole state as, from as far away as you can see the mountain? Because you can see the mountain. No. Uh, you know, but there are some features in there. There are a handful of features that are rather unique. But they really don't require a national park to preserve them. Uh, there is a state preserve in that area uh, on the Wasatacook uh, stream area uh, that is owned by the state. Uh, and they bought that and preserved it a number of years ago because of its unique features. Well, that would be within the proposed boundaries of uh, Roxanne's Park. Well, they're not going to give the federal government the Wasatiquick Stream Preserve, okay? I don't think they will. Uh, we can do very targeted protection activities if we need to do them. You don't need to do a 70,000 acre spread to save 30 or 40 acres of high value uh, land or features. So my answer to you is, I guess the real answer is no one really knows what the study would show, but most of the time when they conduct these studies, the report comes back favorably to the uh, Department of the Interior and the National Park Service for uh, going forward with the National Park. Where, they have got, where they've gotten bogged down in the last couple decades is uh, in Congress and the White House uh, at different times not giving support to those recommended uh, parks. Anything else? I thank you very much for having me. And again, it was very enjoyable. Appreciate your questions and your attention.